Hello and welcome back to the channel. For those of you who uh, follow us know that uh, I have a fairly robust uh, alternator charging system for my lithium battery pack. Uh, this summer I had to use it a lot in order to uh, survive the summer because my solar panels were defective. Uh, that's a, another long story, but the, the, the lesson I learned in using my uh, alternator for charging was that it, it got hot and stayed hot. And when I mean hot, I mean 120 centigrade. And that's uh, about the maximum I ever want it to be, but just in order to get the charging done that I wanted to get done, 90 amps to 100 amps, 120 centigrade, uh, seemed a little bit of a, a stress for my alternator. So I decided that I wanted to try to make my system more robust, possibly even provide some more capacity. Um, and the way to do that was to help the alternator run cooler. And the only way that I can really do that is to remove some heat from the alternator. It's very difficult for me to bring uh, air to the alternator based on where it is. So removing heat from it seemed to be the next best thing. So I decided I was going to uh, remove the diode bridge from the rear of the alternator, uh, place it in a fan shroud where it could be cooled. That removes about half the heat generated in the alternator and it also provides additional air circulation paths in the back of the alternator for the alternator fan. So that's what we're about ready to do. This is a 20 volt, this is actually a 12 volt alternator. The voltage regulator has been bypassed so that I can use an external voltage regulator that allows me to manipulate the output voltage of it so I can charge at any amperage that I want to into my large lithium battery. And the problem with that is, is that this alternator gets very hot. 220 amps rated output, this thing will typically put out somewhere with around 90 amps without overheating and overheating I define as exceeding 120 degrees centigrade or 240 degrees Fahrenheit. I would like to get better performance out of this alternator by increasing its cooling capacity. Its cooling capacity is somewhat limited because the nice flat back of this alternator actually backs right up to the, the head on the passenger side of the engine. So there's very little cooling that can, can occur through here. In addition to that, diode array in the back of this thing blocks a lot of the, the air cooling as well. And plus, the diode array contributes about half of the heat, total heat to the alternator. So if I could remove the diode array, place it elsewhere, I could get better ventilation through the fan, and I could take away that half of that heat away from uh, the alternator. So, so that's the goal. So what you see here right in front of me, this is, this is a original 120 volt alternator and I ran this alternator for a year or so. I've disassembled to prove a few things. This is the back case of the alternator and it goes on here and this is the diode bridge and it mounts into the back of it. I'm actually going to use this diode bridge once I take this one apart in order to get the diodes apart from the back case of this 4G Ford alternator, you actually have to disassemble the diode bridge and I don't want to have to do that. So I could just take this off, keep it intact, and use this one from another alternator which the diode bridge has already been removed. You can see the three, or actually four large holes here where the diodes were press fit into here. And this diode bridge fit on here something like that. And then the voltage regulator went in here something something like actually like yeah, like that that's how the voltage regulator installed the voltage regulator is inside of here this this regulator here has also been bypassed and just to show you what bypassing this alternator looks like i'll pop the cover off of it here and so <clears throat> that's what bypassing the alternator looks like you can see those two uh, simple wires that have been bridged across the and the rest of the regulator has been removed from the from the circuit so that's what's involved in setting it up for an external regulator i needed to determine what the internal structure of this alternator was like different alternators are wired at either a three phase delta configuration or a three phase y configuration i pulled this apart see there's actually six legs of coils here. It turns out that this is one coil, 
this is one coil pair and this is one coil pair. This alternator is actually configured as three separate single phase outputs. Not as neither star nor delta, but it's going to become delta because I, I need to have three single wires coming out of this when I connect it to my bridge rectifier. And the bridge rectifier has three inputs for the three phases of AC and output of uh, positive and negative for that. So this is what's going to be done is to, is to for this alternator is to remove the back shell and the regulator and replace it with this one, uh, six wires into three uh, into a three-phase configuration. From there, each of this this coil of wire, so this is eight gauge tin-plated copper, 200 centigrade silicone insulated uh, wire. It's pretty much the best wire that I can possibly get for this application. Eight gauge is sufficient for this if you if this alternator, this is a 220 amp alternator, so its peak output is 220 amps. Each of the individual phases in here, because of the, the 120 degree phase angle, produce somewhere around 135 amps per phase. So that's 135 amps is what this wire would need to carry. And 135 amps uh, can be carried by an eight gauge wire as long as you're allowing, ready to let the wire get to about 250 degrees, which is what this wire was probably going to run at. I'm also going to use uh, these uh, crimp terminals because I'm a little concerned with the, if, if I were to solder these wires together, I'm a little concerned with them coming apart due to the heat it might experience. So these are going to be placed on here and, and crimped on there and all the internal connections inside the alternator are going to be crimp connected so they don't have to rely on, on solder, although these relied on solder. Uh, it's interesting looking at this alternator. There is some evidence in this alternator that it, uh, it overheated. There's some, you know, yellow stuff that's kind of looks like it's been foamed out of it. This is originally a 120 amp alternator. Um, I had this instrumented and I know that at some points in time this alternator was actually producing 150 amps. Uh, clearly the diodes are not going to survive at that and I <clears throat> took immediate action when it was ever producing that much. Um, this alternator can and does produce 200 amps fairly easily into my batteries and so I want to be comfortable with running 200 amps from this alternator for a half an hour or so. So this is the type of inf equipment that is going to take to uh, put this together. If you've never looked at an automotive alternator bridge rectifier before, you can see this rectifier actually contains eight diodes. There's four on this side and there were one, two, three, four here attached to the back of this back cover. This is what the diodes look like. They're not particularly large, they're about the size of a, a, a cough drop or something like that. Uh, one of the things that it, I've discovered, and this is actually fairly important, is that these diodes are non-avalanche diodes. An avalanche diode is typically used in a modern alternator to suppress uh, voltage spikes that occur because powered equipment is coming on and off regularly. Much more prevalent in newer alternators. When I first started planning to use this alternator, I tried to determine whether these were avalanche diodes and if so, what voltage they functioned at. I was never able to confirm they were avalanche diodes. What I did confirm was that the diodes, if they were avalanche, was at least 29 or 30 volts, which is at the maximum range of my operation, so I was not concerned about them. However, my friend Derek from Australia was following my lead and he was using a Chrysler alternator, a modern uh, variable voltage alternator, trying to do what I did, which was simply to put a 24 volt regulator on it and get 20, 20, up to 28 or 29.4 volts out of it. And he fried his alternator almost immediately because he did have avalanche diodes and those avalanche diodes began conducting at about 24 volts. And these are not avalanche diodes. I've already tested these individually and as a bridge. They will not conduct in reverse up to 60 volts, which is the, the maximum capacity of my power supply. This uh, diode bridge here has a reverse current rating of I think 1600 volts. But in addition to, so this will block any reverse current voltage up to, up to 1600 volts. That means that that voltage will stay inside the alternator, which is uh, not good for the uh, voltage regulator. So one of the other things that we're going to be building here also, these are called transient voltage suppressors. These are a specific type of diode that 
operate at low, uh, low voltage going forward and about 33 volts in reverse. So these five diodes are going to be built onto this bridge rectifier in order to provide some opportunity for voltage spike suppression so I don't end up frying my voltage regulator. The first step in this process is really to strip this alternator down to this point right here. So that, that's what we're going to be doing. I think I mentioned that these are not avalanche diodes, meaning that there is no spike protection available. What I've just determined is that this device right here, which descends down to the bottom of the case here, this is a transient voltage suppression device. And it works by, how, here's just how you can test one and see what it does. I, uh, by blind luck, I hooked it up at the proper polarity. So what a transient voltage suppression device does is it will not, con it will not conduct power at the operating frequencies. So if you see my power supply here, oops, I'm melting my wires. So if you see my power supply here connected to these two terminals, there's no amperage being conducted at 36 and a half volts. And if I were to increase this voltage until I see con actually current is being conducted, this is the voltage at which the suppression begins. And I've already done this, it begins at about 52 volts. There, so you just see one tenth of an amp right there, 51.9, 52 volts, three tenths, and I just go up a little bit and all of a sudden, boom, 52 and a half volts, it's you know, an amp of current through there. So this is, this is the voltage suppression device and that is how you test to see whether it functions or not. Another thing to note, this is the old diode bridge and the wires in this case were inserted through these holes and, and, and soldered inside of there. So in order to desolder this bridge, I had to heat it and then vacuum out the, uh, suck the solder out of there to desolder it. This bridge is slightly different. It's got external tabs here that are each soldered and most of them are not soldered very well. This is, a, this is a, a, an inexpensive Chinese made alternator, but that one and that one are both poorly soldered. I'm about ready to take them all apart so it, and it's not gonna matter, but it is a little bit of a concern to see uh, inferior uh, soldering and high current joints. As you can see here, my preferred method of desoldering these is first off this is a 150 watt soldering iron is to heat the joint up and blast it with compressed air to get the majority of the solder out while I pry it apart and there it is One of the downsides of blasting out solder with air is sometimes the solder flies back on you, which it just did. Let's see. So the entire back case, if it's loose from the wires, should come off. Those are loose. Those are loose. And that's all but one is loose. But now it's just a little bit of prying. We're actually, as much as anything, we're pulling this off of the bearing, which means we should be try to be fairly straight. And there we go. So this is going to be replaced by this. I'm going to figure out exactly where and how it goes. A lot of things happening. We got six uh, trios of wires. Each of these windings is made up of three 15 gauge copper wires. So there's one winding here, one winding is here and here, and one winding is here and here. The first thing that I did was to crimp a, a, a 10 gauge uh, uninsulated butt splice onto the end of each of the windings. And then I put the back cover on because I knew I couldn't get close enough with the crimper to crimp it on there. 
Well, actually, it was hard enough to, to get into the, to the crimp the next wire on there. So each of these uh, three 15-gauge wires comes out and goes into one 10-gauge solid wire. So there's, there's a 10-gauge a, a uh, crimp here. And, and just for your information, the cross-sectional area of a 10-gauge solid is just slightly larger than three 15-gauge wires. And then once all six of those were, were done that way, then I took each of the, the winding ends that I wanted to have to turn it into a uh, three-phase configuration. So that's what you have laying here. So I think this is going to provide a lot better ventilation for this, uh, this alternator. Okay, this is uh, pretty much the end of this phase of the project. This is the top of the fan shroud for the F-350. I've cut a hole into it. It uh, has another piece of the section that grips onto here and it runs into the radiator. So this is the, this is the front of the truck. This is the rear of the truck. The three phases from the alternator will f uh, feed into the uh, diode bridge here and positive and negative will come out here inside of the flow channel of the radiator fan. This literally the radiator fan is directly behind this. So this should get some pretty decent airflow uh, whenever the truck is running. Now it's ready to go back on. Okay, we're getting down to uh, wrapping up this project. The second phase of the project after modification of the alternator was to build and install this bridge rectifier right here in the fan shroud, which you can see has been done. These red cables are what I built into the alternator to bring the three-phase AC out of the power out of the alternator into this three-phase bridge rectifier. Uh, positive and negative come out here, and these are two-gauge cables run back to the camper battery. One of the things that you might be able to see right here is there's two electronic devices here. These are uh, transient voltage suppressors. Uh, normally speaking, there is some transients created in an alternator caused by switching on and off heavy loads to it. So I have these two of them installed right here, where, right where the DC output comes. But I've also installed one on the voltage regulator, and I'll show you that in a minute. The third phase of this thing is actually testing and validating, and, and that's going to have to wait a little bit because I don't have the power meter. Uh, if you recall from my uh, center console reconstruction, uh, one of the things that was uh, broken on arrival was the power meter for the 24 volt system. So until that shows up, uh, this is going to remain uh, at this state right here. So recapping, you can see this is the 24 volt alternator. It's driven by its own six groove serpentine belt. Uh, the power output of it used to be right here, and it's no longer here. The field control is here. So the entire back side of this alternator, I can now stick my finger down inside there, hopefully will we'll be able to breathe a lot better than it has in the past. And you can see the wires down inside here that come out from underneath the alternator, wrap around the charge air cooling pipe, and come up along the fan shroud here to the diode bridge. The power from there, this is now DC power. And this power runs over here to the uh, this is the uh, power distribution for the vehicle. This is the negative block. This is the positive block. You can see there's a lot of, lot of grounded wires. This is the uh, current shunt for the brand new console meter for the for the uh, 24 volt. And and so this is this cable right here that comes in here is the one that comes from the alternator, and the one that goes up to the camper goes out here. So the 24 volt ground and the 12 volt ground are connected together at this point and this point only. They are a common ground.
One last thing to, to show is this is the, the fuse panel underneath of the, uh, steering the steering columns right here, and then this is the 24 volt Expo vo or excuse me Transpo Voyager 2400 regulator, and you can see right here this the, the black wire is the ground, the yellow wire is the field to the alternator, and there's a TVS uh, installed in that right there just to make sure that anything that uh, happens in the alternator doesn't come out here and affect the voltage regulator. All right, well, that's the end of the story. Thank you very much for coming uh, along with me for this. I hope you stayed uh, through all the twists and turns and, and made it to the end. The uh, performance of this uh, modification, you're gonna have to wait until the some later video because I, I don't think I'm supposed to get my meter for another week, and so the truck's just gonna sit here. I'm gonna move it on another project. I appreciate you coming by our YouTube channel and, and watching uh, all of our content. We enjoy making it and we would further enjoy you subscribing and or liking uh, our content so that we can uh, get more others like-minded people interested in it as well. Thank you very much.